Hello, I'm Greg with Brownell Rights. Today we're going to talk about a fun experience that I had this past weekend with a student that was here for mentorship. Now, some of you may not know that we do in-person training here and that you can come visit and take a course. I really love the in-person instruction that I get to do. The primary reason for that is, is everyone's different. <laughs> Every shooter uh, they're always in a, a different place. Their, their situation, the rifle that they bring, the ammunition that they bring, the equipment that they have along with them, it's all very unique to them. Even though I may have seen some of the equipment before, the combination of things that the shooter brings is always very specific to them. The other thing that I really like is everyone is a different individual. And so the kind of training that we get to do in a one-on-one -on -one scenario is always different. Some people would prefer to work on rifle handling. Other people would prefer to spend more time um, at the load bench. And other people might want to spend the entire time doing wind reading. And we offer specific one-on-one -on -one instruction on all of these topics. And obviously, we, we generally like to pick one that we're going to be working on for the duration of that person's stay here. But this past weekend, we had a specific thing that this particular shooter was struggling with more than all of the rest of the variables. And I find that that too is a constant. Everybody's different and therefore it seems like everyone's going to have a different thing that they struggle with more than the other aspects of the discipline. Now, it bears mentioning that this particular shooter had probably the best ammunition of anyone that's showed up here before. He's a very intelligent, very analytical man, and he had documentation of everything, uh, which is fantastic. So he, he had put in a, a good amount of effort at the reloading bench, and he was able to bring some great ammunition. His rifle was also pretty well worked out and was shooting extremely well. Every time I get the opportunity to, I like to shoot the rifle and, and the ammunition, the entire package that the student is working with, I want to get on that thing and shoot it myself. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, but one of the primary reasons is to just make sure that the system that the student is working with has the capability to respond to his inputs. A rifle, ammo, optic, uh, the entire ecosystem, that package, if it's shooting and performing too poorly, then oftentimes I'll have to bring out one of my own rifles and ammo and everything in order for the student to have a worthwhile time here. But in this particular instance, this rifle ammunition combination was extremely good. Every single round that I fired through this person's rifle, I hit within like a tenth of an inch of exactly in the very center of my point of aim. So it was capable of shooting in the zeros and ones. Now, I generally like to get this figured out fairly early in the session to make sure we're not wasting a bunch of time. And so I was able to get the rifle zeroed to pinpoint level. It demonstrated that it was shooting very, very small, very early. And so we were able to proceed with the training. And of course, as we get into it just a little bit, the very common question comes up of, well, you know, I'm consistently shooting this thing uh, right in the very center of the intended point of aim. And the student was very consistently shooting about a tenth or two tenths of a mil to the right. And this happens almost as a matter of course, right? Where um, I shoot the rifle differently than the way that they're shooting the rifle. And of course, they're not shooting the rifle mechanically correct. And so the point of impact shift when you're not driving the rifle properly is gonna be pretty obvious for anyone that's had some instruction regarding natural point of aim and how you're influencing the rifle. The first tendency of the shooter is always to, well, let's just re-zero it for me so that I can hit. And like, well, if we do that, then Every time you shoot this thing, that correct zero is going to shift around based on just exactly how you're interfaced with the rifle. And that's the whole point of this. We want to make sure that you're interfacing the rifle correctly and not violating natural point of aim at any point during the recoil impulse. Not before, 
not during, and not after. After a brief explanation of why we didn't want to re-zero this rifle, we just continued our work. And throughout the day, uh, the student's understanding of what was taking place expanded exponentially, as is usually the case, and we're able to demonstrate these effects real-time with live fire on the target because we talk about an effect, we, we try it, we demonstrate, okay, try it this way, now try it this way, and you can see the results moving around on the target despite um, the observance of what's going on uh, up here at the shooter being different from shot to shot, and we're being, we can kind of explain what's going on here and draw some very tight correlations to how the rifle is moving versus what the bullet impact is doing downrange. Now this particular shooter was able to grasp the body positioning elements and the way to get straight behind the rifle and uh, understand that what we're seeing as far as movement in the rifle scope versus the uh, movement of the actual rifle, like if the crosshair goes to the right in relation to your target, well then the rear of the rifle went to the left. And he was very switched on and able to understand those principles very cleanly. He was struggling with his trigger finger, his position of his trigger finger in relation to not only just how his finger should be on the rifle, but the positioning of his trigger finger on the shoe of the trigger. He had a flat trigger in the rifle, which makes vertical positioning harder if you're not very familiar with this. Uh, obviously, you can overcome various different trigger designs and things like that if you understand what right looks like. But if you don't, well then, it can be very difficult kind of hunting around on the trigger and have his finger was in a uh, different position on the trigger shoe each time, even when we got his finger mechanically locked out to a 90 degree, it was still kind of in a different spot every single time on the pad of his finger and on the shoe of the trigger. So this illuminated something that's just uh, fantastic because he, he had such a well worked out rifle system and his ability to overcome most of the other things was very advanced. He, he moved very quickly through the different concepts. But this trigger finger position thing, he just wasn't lacking on. So I had him shoot two five-shot groups. And we're shooting at 100 yards at half-inch dots, as we most commonly do for this type of training. The two groups aggregate, they measured, you know, right about one MOA in total. And there was usually one kind of high, one kind of low, and then three that were kind of somewhere toward the middle kind of clustered up. And two of them back to back that looked just like that. Then changing nothing else, I had the rifle put on safe and then I would physically manipulate his hand and his trigger finger and get it into what is mechanically the right position for every rifle. Once I would get him in perfect position, I would put the rifle on fire and then he would take a shot. And we did that for like three or four shots. And I think one of them, he admitted that he had, uh, you know, either breathing or he kind of jumped on it. You know, he was able to, to convey to me that if something was off about that one, which that's good, right? The ability to self-diagnose, that's, that's what we're looking for here. But three of those shots, landed in a group that measured in the zeros, high zeros, low ones. I mean, it was just one little tiny knot. At that point, he was just absolutely blown away that those tiny, small, impers almost imperceptible differences of where he was putting his finger on that trigger could result in that much of a change in precision. Because the thing that I left out, his groups that he fired by himself, five shot groups at 100 yards, the groups were centered on point of aim. So he was accurate for the most part, right? Because the average location of the shots, the group's center was roughly right over point of aim. However, the precision was very poor roughly one MOA. 
these next shots, his precision and accuracy were phenomenal. Meaning that not only were all three of those honest shots right in a little tiny cluster, being very, very precise, but they were also centered on point of aim. So accuracy and precision, and the only thing that we changed was the position of the finger in relation to the trigger. Your position on the trigger shoe is not just limited to the effects of if you don't press the trigger straight to the rear, then you can, by the weight that you're putting on the trigger, violate natural point of aim. So if you press the trigger back and to the left, well, during recoil, the rear of that rifle is going to move to the left, and your barrel subsequently is going to move to the right. You'll see that effect often in your rifle scope, and then too, by extension, the, where the round lands down range, you might see that to the right as well. In a very worked out rifle system, you can replicate that fairly easily. It's not always that way, but generally it will be that way. Fairly easy to grasp that part. But what isn't talked about often is the fact that how you are connecting to these rifles, and I mean everything from your trigger finger, your hand in support of your trigger finger there and its connection with the stock and your face on the cheek riser of the gun, how you're connecting to these rifles will change how they resonate. Now this is commonly referred to as a harmonic, how when we're tuning a load during our load development process to the rifle, we're essentially altering the timing and thus the harmonic of how the rifle moves, how it resonates, and that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Now, I say resonate, and when I say resonate or resonance, you understand that we're talking about a vibration. While it might be obvious that violation of natural point of aim due to off-axis pressure on the gun, either you're muscling the gun, you're not letting it sit in the bag correctly, um, you're not in neutral, in idle position, if you will. Well, that by itself is an effect, but the resonance is affected regardless if we do all of those things mechanically correct or not. Now, this is most readily visualized if you were to think of a tuning fork. Now, some of you probably have messed with tuning forks before, and you wrap them against something, and they get to ringing, and you can hear them. You can also oftentimes see the vibration. And if you were to touch the tuning fork at the very tip of one of the forks, well, it's going to stop in a certain way. Now, you get that thing to ringing again the same way, and this time you touch it in a different place. Well, the effect that you'll have on where you touch it and by how much pressure you put on it will change what happens to the resonance or the vibration of it drastically from one position to the next. When we're dealing with these rifles, it would be very beneficial to remember that essentially we have a tuning fork effect taking place. Now, mechanically, it's different, folks. You don't have to state the obvious here that a rifle barrel in action isn't a tuning fork, but the vibration that's taking place is similar enough to where we can use this analogy to speak intelligently about this. So consider for a moment that you have a trigger hanging down off of a barreled action. That trigger sticking down off of there is connected very rigidly in most cases to the barreled action, which is the source of this resonance. How we connect up to it and how that barreled action is able to vibrate dictates how it will shoot. Now, things like tuners or suppressors or different muzzle devices, when you put them on there, you're changing the weight, the length, and you're also changing how the pressure coming out the muzzle interfaces with all of this. And everyone agrees and knows that your gun's probably going to shoot differently, both in accuracy and precision, if you put something different on the barrel. 
Well, why then is it such a stretch and why is it so hard to believe that your location of your trigger finger in relation to the trigger shoe can also alter the effects of how this barrel action resonates? Well, then you start thinking about this logically and you might have just had some very big aha light bulb moments when you think of, wow, the bedding job, how this barreled action is supported by the stock. That is, too, also very important. It might illuminate things like, why do foundation stocks shoot so well? <laughs> why do foundation stocks, despite having no bedding, shoot well? Well, the material that the foundation stock is made out of is designed to dampen vibration. <laughs> kind of obvious, but when you say it out loud, you tie it into this effect of like, well, this is something that we can very visibly see and we can reproduce on rifle systems that are capable enough. Now, if you've got a rifle that's shooting one MOA at its very best, and you don't know anything about these types of techniques, and you're not driving the rifle right, and you're not interfacing with the rifle right, um, you could completely change how you're doing everything on the rifle and doing it 100% mechanically correct, and the rifle still will not respond because it's just not capable of more than that With as a result of either a bad barrel or maybe you didn't do the load dev right or it's got a bad optic or optic mounting on it. There's so many variables that it can be. It takes a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience to, with some finality, detect which of these things is causing the problem. Just because you switch and start doing everything correctly doesn't mean that this problem will go away. But it does mean that if you're not doing these things correctly, then it doesn't matter how good your rifle system is, you may not be able to get the kind of performance downrange that you're wanting. This is pretty much why the in-person element of our training is so paramountly important, is because these types of things are so complex that if you've not been into the discipline for a very long period of time, you might miss this. Like, you, you could skate right over the top of this and be struggling with poor performance and have no idea why. But if you're here and I'm able to see exactly what's going on, see how the rifle's moving and how you're interfacing with it, talk with you about what you're viewing through the rifle scope and how everything is looking, well, then we can figure these things out in short order and almost immediately identify what the weak point is and get it addressed. And by that way, propel you to an entirely different plateau as a shooter. So the shooter left here with a very clear picture of what they should be working on and then to how to set up tests for themselves, um, how to set up training for themselves at home so that we can better talk through what they're experiencing at some point in the future after they've had a chance to work on these techniques for a little while. Well, to wrap this up, folks, if your rifle is not shooting right and seemingly nothing that you can do to, to make it shoot right, you've tried a bunch of load work, you've tried a bunch of changing components on the rifle, you've tried different bullets, different this, different that, and really nothing is changing, well, could be you. <laughs> it could be you. And uh, the, the hard part here is, is if you don't have access to a rifle that you know is absolutely worked out and shooting very small, well then how can you know whether it's you or the gun? And the answer is you, you kind of can't. If you don't know what your capabilities are as a shooter because you've never once had the opportunity to shoot a rifle system that's completely worked out, it may be impossible for you to work on some of these smaller, more finite level of advancements of how you're holding the rifle, how you're interfacing with the trigger, all these small little variables on rifle handling. You might not even be able to work on them because despite what you do, there's no real change or alteration of what's happening downrange. That, I think, is one of the biggest opportunities that we provide here is I have an abundance of rifle systems that are shooting very small, better than quarter MOA, that if your system is not capable of doing it, one of mine certainly is, and we can at least find out whether or not there's some improvement to be made with your system. And it's pretty obvious what happens, folks, when somebody is, is really struggling with one of their rifles. I'll put them on one of mine, and lo and behold, just about in every single instance, 
boing, that shooter's performance just gets much smaller than they've ever seen before in their life. And that just speaks to the reality that there's nothing in this discipline that exists in a vacuum. It requires the support of all of the other aspects, whether it be the load bench or the components that we choose to buy or the parts to our rifle that we choose to buy and who we decide to have build the rifle. Um, all of this stuff matters. There's not one variable that can be left behind. And if we attempt to get lazy and think that, well, we can just choose not to work on certain aspects of this, that will tend to creep up and bite us later on if we intend to continue our pursuit of this discipline and try to have higher levels of performance later on. If you think you might be benefited from some of our instruction here, then I would encourage you to get enrolled in our mentorship program first. Now, you do that by signing up by using the little join button on the YouTube channel. Just about any of our YouTube videos or our YouTube channel has a little join button. And if you don't see that, you're probably on an iPhone or some other um, Apple mobile device. You might need to request the desktop site in order to see it. When you get signed up at the apprentice level or higher, you get direct access to me in a mentorship capacity, and that's one-on-one, -on -one, folks. That's not group setting. That's just you and I getting on the phone and talking or doing a Zoom or Skype or some other video call if that's what you'd like to do. But that gives you the ability to have me personally instruct you and help you with some of these different effects. And that's where it starts. Now, if you'd like to push that even further and come here for a one-on-one -on -one training session, well, then you can just give me a call and schedule when you'd like to come to get your instruction. Our schedule, I try to keep that fairly open where I'll only take a limited number of students per year to make sure that the effect is as great as possible. There's enough time for each student. And unlike group training type things where you might not get any one-on-one -on -one time or very limited one-on-one -on -one time, here, the only way we do the training is one-on-one. -on -one. Now, mostly we only do the one-on-one -on -one trainings, very limited exceptions uh, where we would do more than one person. But spend the entire time together that way we go at the pace that you can absorb as fast as you'd like to or as slow as you'd like to, spending as much time on each individual aspect as, as you need in order to get the goals that you have set forth met. And all this is initiated with just a phone call, so you can feel free to just give us a ring and we can talk through whether or not you'd be benefited by the instruction or whether you'd be best benefited by just watching a bunch of uh, YouTube videos. And I've got a ton of content on the YouTube channel. The vast majority of people don't watch most of it, which is I find very strange because what they come here to learn could be advanced significantly quicker if they would absorb the content that I've already provided. But then, too, time being what it is, some folks would rather just come and spend a couple of days and get jump-started jump ahead a lot farther than they would if they tried to do it on their own. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll catch you next time.